Magic gave birth to Eternia, the first planet in all of creation. But now the magic is gone. And without magic, Eternia will rot and die. So, again, this was a, uh, a case where I let the guests pick what we were talking about, kind of an apology since I couldn't get our original IP that I talked about, that I teased, to, to work. And thankfully, Dave's first suggestion was something that I'd already been interested in and, and was kind of making waves, both in terms of being... It, I feel like this is the latest in a, in a trend of things that are critically acclaimed, but fans are all over the place with this. Um, mm. But I wasn't as concerned about that because compared to Star Wars, this is something I have I, IP I have more of a casual history with. So Dave, let me talk to you first, or ask you first, what's your history with uh, Masters of the Universe and He-Man as a property? So I, I really wish that I could say that I watched the cartoon a lot when I was a kid. Um, but unfortunately, because of the way that the TV worked in the UK, um, I kind of got screwed out of being able to watch it. He-Man was very big in terms of its presence in the toy market in the yeah. UK. Apparently it, it, was, it was a phenomenon. Yeah, but it wasn't on TV at all. Massive oversight by somebody, but there you go. Maybe so I some owned, ratings. Yeah, uh, I, I owned a uh, Cringer slash Battle Cat um, from back in the day. And uh, it's interesting, actually, if you watch the Netflix documentary, uh, Power of Greyskull, I think it's called, where they talk about the history of the He-Man franchise and uh, where the toys came from and all that kind of stuff. The, the, the Cringer character was actually a, re a retooling uh, of a toy from another Mattel line. Yeah. Uh, so it was from some kind of like animals of the jungle kind of line, and they literally just took a tiger. Yeah, he's basically and, a tiger, and just recolored him green, and and then they they designed the the battle armor to go with it, and and that was Cringer, um, and Battle go. Cat. Yeah, and so I, go ahead. Hmm. So so I owned um, Battle Cat. I didn't own He-Man or Skeletor, which was weird. But, you know, that's often the way that things go with toys. You you pick the one that you like, and then you don't get any of the others. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, that was pretty much, as far as He-Man was concerned, until the new series turned up, which is the horrendous... Oh, man. I mean, well, I'll talk about it for a second. Go ahead. Um, go ahead. We're, talking so, about, we're talking about prior He-Man stuff first. Yeah, so the new adventures of He-Man... <laughs> was basically Mattel's attempt to make money off of another established toy line. Um, they, the, the, the story goes that He-Man has essentially beaten Skeletor and now he has been sucked into some kind of time vortex and thrust into the future. Um, and Skeletor is there as well. And so the reason that He-Man looks so different is because he's in the future now. And he's got a different sword, and he's got armor, and he, there is nothing about him that's the same. And essentially, they use this as an excuse to get a bunch of like uh, three and a half inch figures and uh, sell them under the He-Man name. Oh, because, smaller figures. Yeah, they weren't as big as the original ones. They were a completely different toy line, which pre-existed, and they wanted basically to sell it under the He-Man branding. So yeah. they came up with this poorly conceived idea for the new adventures of He-Man. It did not last either. It didn't last, but ironically, it lasted longer on UK TV than the original did. Huh. Maybe, so, maybe yeah. The, maybe the broadcasting rights were cheaper. Uh, well, yeah, because it was absolute trash, so I imagine it probably was. <laughs> God, I'm looking at... This is the only He-Man cartoon that I've seen, like, never even seen a clip of. Uh, Skeletor looks god-awful on this show. Yeah. They gave him out. eyes. He looks so goofy. Yeah, yeah, the eyes were a terrible mistake. Like, there, there's something... Even with the... With, with the, um... The, the voice... Uh, with the... <laughs> <laughs> The original, like Oppenheimer, does such a good job with Skeletor, makes him very, very hammy. But his appearance, the look of Skeletor, like OG Skeletor, really, really good. Really, yeah, quite... he looks, he looks intimidating. He does, um, and I think they do do a really good job with the reboot um, in 
about 2004, I want to say. Yes, that's what I want to bring up. Apparently, it's 2002, uh, but it aired until around 2004. It lasted two seasons. Uh, that was my proper introduction to He-Man. Uh, over in the States, it ran on Toonami, which uh, I don't know if you've heard of that, but that's like – that was uh, – yeah. That was like my anime mecca as a teen. I was introduced to so much cool stuff back then. But they they didn't just do anime; they did action cartoons as well. And that was where they housed, uh, hosted a this first proper attempt at a He Man reboot because this wasn't like some new world or time vortex. This was new takes on the classic characters and setting. And from what I remember, it was quite good. I yeah. believe fans of He Man look look at it pretty fondly. Uh, I thought it. Yep. Uh, looked looked really good for the time uh i thought it had some cool ongoing story elements it didn't it it felt like they added because what, what i could tell the original isn't very uh i'm sure part of it was the censorship at the time but it, it was it was a pretty light-hearted show all things considered you know there were plenty of jokes yeah. you weren't seeing blood or death or that sort of stuff it was kind of just classic saturday morning cartoon fair like probably comparable to something like ninja turtles and hey, go ahead my, my- I'm sorry, go on. Oh, okay. And 2002 was still like it was still very kid friendly, but it did it did feel like it was taking the world a little more seriously. And it also made me notice that again, watching what we're going to talk today, with that being the Masters of the Universe revelation, Eternia is a really cool setting because mm-hmm. it's not just that it's a medieval fantasy world with magic and wizards and and demons and types monsters. Monsters. There's advanced technology as well, like stuff like weaponry and computers beyond our our own stuff. So it's this, it's this really cool fusion, and you don't really see that kind of mashup much in mainstream media. No, it, it is a real rarity. Like I struggle to think of anything else where magic and technology exist on such an evil... F- uh, evil? <laughs> oh, good Lord. Uh, even footing. Yeah, there's probably um, some anime. Yeah, I, I'm sure that there is stuff within anime where, where that's the case. But certainly, like, in the Western world, like... Off the top of my head, I think, um, oh my god, what was the name of the... Describe it. No, um, god damn it, Borderlands. Oh, I... That's got, that's got a little bit of a, like a magic vibe to it with the Technomancer, um, character. Uh, I guess so. I, I kind of feel, I've always viewed Borderlands, I haven't played it much, but I viewed it as, as very Mad Max inspired, uh, aesthetically. It's it's got a little bit of the Mad Max thing going for it. I mean, it, it's not particularly magic orientated, but I maybe in fact I'm getting that completely off base here. But like, uh, the techno- you know more about it than me. Uh, I don't know. Maybe it was more hacking uh, than anything else. Ah, uh, let's let's move on. Okay. Um, no, Year is a very very cool um, setting. Definitely. Um, something about the 2002 series, which I really liked, was the fact that. They give Skeletor like a, a an absolute beginning. Like yeah, this they is... show he was a guy who tried to like stage a coup or something. Uh, got some acid he was going to use on the face and went hiding for a while and came back as Skeletor. Yeah, like his face was melted off. Like how badass is that? You know, like, that's pretty cool. Yeah, um, yeah, and they, I, well, Skeletor is I think in every incarnation that's a cartoon he is a mix of real a real threat but he is also very very like humorous in certain ways yeah absolutely Um, i I think that oppenheimer definitely um as the original voice actor for uh skeletor i i think he uh deserves a lot of credit for that Um, yeah alan oppenheimer for people who don't know is a prolific voice actor uh 91 Mm. and still acting he cameos as as moss man in the the new show we're going to talk um Mm. And uh, I know him as Falcor from Neverending Story. Oh, of course, yes, yeah, his most iconic role. Probably. Uh, <laughs> um, but uh, I, the other, my other proper experience with He Man, uh, kind of its fatal flaw, I'd say, is that is that is getting away from Eternia. I did watch the live action movie, Dolph Lundgren. Uh- yeah, I've I've got a weird relationship with that film. Like, I know it's bad. I know it's awful. Like it, it is a terrible, terrible movie. It it's was made right. by. Canada. Of course, it's bad. But God, I love it. I, I really mean, it's, do. It's it's kind of fun. I just it's it's, it's very far removed from uh, 
you know, but I mean, and again, it was just the case that you should have had a bigger given it to someone with a bigger budget because then you get a whole Eternian movie. And I, I think also Dolph Lundgren was he fits the part physically, but his his diction didn't. Yeah, um, I I struggle to think at the time was there an actor out there that could have done the role who fit the mold and really you're getting into you you literally there are three or four action heroes around about that sort of time who had the physique that they probably could have done it. And to be honest with you, I don't think Jean-Claude Van Damme has the stature. No, he's, he's not huge enough. No, I don't think Stallone has got the the largeness either. So it comes down to either Dolph Lundgren or Arnold Schwarzenegger. And if you want to talk about diction, let's talk about <laughs> 1980s Arnold. Yeah. Uh, yep. <laughs> There's a reason they barely had him say much in Terminator. Yeah, yeah. He was he was paid well for those words, though. <laughs> right. But um, and well, I think a lot. Uh, well, you know, I will. I will st- to go a little back on what I said about scale. What makes scale tour work? Because a lot of people will do point to Frank Langella as the best part, like the genuine best part of that movie. He eats the scenery in that movie, and he he approached it with such relish. But I find it really difficult. Like I I can I can sit here and say what's good and what's bad about that movie, and what's bad is massively massively more Dude, than. You, you, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna judge you for liking it. One of my big guilty pleasures is the Super Mario Brothers movie. So it's oh man, they're like birds of a feather. Those the movies, the size of a coin. These these drastically <laughs> batshit altered adaptations, and yeah. you know, you gotta uh, yeah. you gotta admire the gonzo ness of it. It's it, it's strange. I I think the the problem with the Masters of the Universe movie wasn't so much. It was my. Any- it, it it was canon at the end of the day that's who it was like canon wanted to make this movie but then they found out they didn't have the budget to do what they wanted and there is a documentary i think it may actually be part of the power of gray skull documentary um where they go into the details behind it although there is a really fascinating documentary which i saw it was on netflix at the time and i think because there are two competing documentaries and this one was the unofficial version oh. that canon didn't have any involvement with but it was a documentary that um was it oh was it electric boogaloo about canon yes that's, that's a good documentary i cannot believe that company it's excellent but they do talk very briefly about masters of the universe yeah as it well. was it was it was a part it was done while the company was starting to flounder and they viewed it as their ticket out of there but that didn't pan out and, and then, the the thing that I always find interesting is that their plan for their next blockbuster had things worked out was a James Cameron Spider Man movie. I can't get my head around that at all. Like I, short I, turning the camera sideways and having him <laughs> crawling up the side but of. But it's a, James like, Cameron. He's an an effects and choreography like pro. So I I wonder. I wonder. Like hot off of Aliens and Terminator, he might have he might have been able to pull something off. They they would have had to absolutely mortgage the hell out of everything they owned to That's get true. the body together to make That's that true, movie with justice. Mm. But um, yeah. So so there he managed to have a storied storied uh, life. It's there's certainly been some. I guess there have been two big gaps in like new approaches of the show. Like I guess you had one in the eighties, one in the nineties, one two thousands. Nothing in the twenty tens. Uh, but I, I I'm aware that it has a big like fan base to this day. I'm sure part of that is is people who it had a big impact on as kids. So now we have I, – I think this is interesting because I went into this uh, or almost I, up till like right before I started watching it when I did some research. I had assumed this was another reboot, but technically it is a continuation of the original 80s show. Yeah, that's right. So um, <clears throat> they were at pains when they – made the announcement about this. Um, being a, a relatively big Kevin Smith fan, uh, I, I'm not too far away from any announcement of anything that he's doing because yeah. if you follow him on Twitter, you know when he's doing something because yeah. he'll tell you. Yeah, uh, I did um, want to touch on, yeah, because I know you're you've, uh, you're a Kevin Smith fan and I, I am to a degree as well because me and my brother discovered his original run of USQ films in high school and loved those. Um, mm. And I haven't rushed to see his later work because I, I know he's kind of branched out on trying different things directorially, and some things have worked better than others. Like I tried Yoga Hosers on a whim and tapped out after 15 minutes. Not my thing. Uh, <laughs> but I have heard good things about Red State and Jay and Silent Bob reboot. So I think he's definitely – and I know he's doing Clerks 3 now, so I think he's definitely still got potential on him. Yeah, he um, he said recently that he went through a stage of trying to be a proper film director. And uh, 
then he realised that if he wasn't going to make Kevin Smith movies, no one was going to. Yeah, so, I know that. I think he even said, like, I don't expect Yoga Hoshers to be received well, but I want to make the stuff that I want to make. And I, I got to give him mm. props for that. That's that's cool. Massively respect that. The fact that he went out and made Tusk, uh, which, which is, is a, a movie. Which is premise. It's, it's a movie which is inspired entirely by a podcast episode where they were talking about um, a, a story that uh, that they'd found about someone that had advertised on, on a, a site for a, a flatmate. But the uh, the requirement was, well, I don't want any rent, but once a week you must dress yourself in a walrus outfit uh, because I'm a former sailor and I was shipwrecked and I made friends with a, a walrus. <laughs> Uh, name. And yeah, and it turned out actually that this um, advert for a flatmate was completely made up okay. by a dude that lived in the UK, and he ended up getting a production credit on the movie. Yeah, because when based Smith, on he was like, "Well, look, my film is based on the story you made up, so you have to have a story credit now." Yeah. Like that's all really fair. But you know, the fact that he's gone from doing that and doing Red State, which is like, I. I think that that is such an effective movie and it's the only horror movie that Smith has ever done and it's just, well, I suppose you could say Tusk is a horror movie but it's more body horror rather than anything else. It's such a solid film, it really is. And it's so scary because of the fact that it's so close to the reality of, of what could be because... Of crazy you know, evangelicals. Eat crazy evangelicals but also, you know, Waco is still in living memory for a lot of people. And, you know, that is the worst nightmare, is a religious cult who are armed to the teeth and decide that they're not going to let anybody get to them. Right, um, right, that sort of stuff, yeah. I'm sure, I'm sure he was he was drawing from, from real stuff for that. Um, mm -hmm. But, yeah, so, so Kevin Smith is a very interesting individual. And, I, yeah, I, I, he seems the right age to be a big fan of the original. Like, I'm, I'm guessing he was in like elementary school or middle school or something during right. it. So I, I think my my understanding because he was born in the seventy the early seventies I think right he's so he would have been like nine or ten when He Man launched yeah. in eighty one eighty two so yeah kind of age and he he was definitely aware of He Man and he's said as much as he watched the show I don't think he has called himself like a massive fan of it but he's done more than his share of research and clued himself up and surrounded him with the right people. And the thing about this show is, and I think this is something that a lot of detractors have missed, is the fact that this was made entirely with the with, with the the say so of Mattel Television. Like they are the joint production company along with Powerhouse Animation Studios. Yeah, they uh, they get an opening credit. Yeah, um, and if you were doing something with their cash cow, and let's not mince words, this is a cash cow for Mattel, oh, yeah. if it gets done right. I think they still do figure reprints and stuff, and they actually are doing uh, figures and based on this show. Yeah. If if you do something that they don't want you to do with their character, they will not let you do it. And Kevin Smith has managed to put out a show that Mattel are happy with. Uh, he was brought onto the project by a massive super fan mm. of um, of the show, um, the guy who actually r runs the um, PowerCon, um, you know, the, yes. the Heat uh, Masters of the Universe uh, convention. Yeah. Um, and, you know, every time that he's talked about what they've done to bring this together, he's always talked about how he's got people around him who know the pro the thing and, and love the thing and like you can tell from the opening couple of episodes that there are so many references to he-man past there's even references to the canon movie oh i missed that i love um so you know when um uh Teela takes out the uh the the little no not Teela, he-man he takes out a couple of discs in heaven and um, that's right throws, those were in the movie the weren't they those are the those are the floating discs that the henchmen use in the movie. Yeah. Right. Uh, oh my god. I thought that I forgot about that. Yeah, and he even says, "Remember these?" And it's he says like, something it's, like, "I know you don't really like this or something." I I think there's yeah. a, a jab at at the movie's reputation. Yeah, but that's the thing. Like, this is something which was made with everybody in mind, and I know it didn't go the way that some people wanted it to, and I'm sure we're going to talk about that as we get into this. Probably, but. 
for me personally, I think it's a really well done ode to the original series and it updates it and brings it into the now. It has made this show more adult. It's actually allowed us to see someone getting stabbed, which is something you would never see on the original He-Man. Or set on fire. Or set on fire. Like that it's this this show knows what its audience is and it's going for it. Yeah, I I feel like the tone the overall tone is pretty similar to the 2002 one but mm. with a bit more actual like consequence and death because like i said the, the bits i've seen of og he-man make it seem pretty lighthearted, but it seems like with every new incarnation maybe to account for the fan base growing up more they add a little more grit each time yeah yeah and there's been a lot of uh, talk over the years especially with the uh, the dc universe of movies how oh why is everyone making everything so dark and gritty and uh like you know coming out the other side of it now i can be say like yeah they, they probably shouldn't have gone as hard as they did down the dark and gritty route with a lot of the things that they did that with but there is a certain advantage when you're talking about bringing back a franchise for a uh, a, a fan base which have grown up and whose tastes are so much more diverse and complex than they were when they were eight you need to do something to update the world of of that thing because you know i i love thundercats right right I'm a big fan of thundercats right but when they finally decided to release them on dvd i bought the dvd set and i watched a few episodes and i was like this is shit <laughs> like this is, like it, it's not good television it's great nostalgia but every episode is the same lino loses his sword Lion-O does something against the advice of everyone else. lion learns his lesson. lion gets his sword back. He calls everybody to help him out, and the bad guys run away. Nobody gets stabbed. Nobody dies. Nobody gets burnt to death. There's no combat of any interest whatsoever, no consequence. It's literally just a half-hour morality tale that happens to also have a tie-in merchandise line that you can buy for your kids. And... This show that we've, we're talking about today is not designed as a half-hour toy commercial. It's designed as something which is taking the basic concept of what He-Man was, it's updating it for a now mature audience who have got much more diverse tastes and have actually lived lives and understand that there's more to the world than, you know, saying, I am the power, or sorry, I, I have the power, uh, punching the ground knocking everybody over and watching them run away in fear. Like, it's more difficult than that, you know? Yeah, it's, uh, it, this This lets us see the world change because we're going to get into it, but I'd say the premise of this initial, because I'd say these first five episodes, it's, I think they've split, they've done the thing, they split a full production season in half, and we'll be right. seeing more late this year or early next year. The The setup is basically, so let's take the world of Eternia, but what does that world look like if you get rid of He-Man, Skeletor, and magic? How is that going to affect people, and how is this going to affect our existing allies and bad guys? And yeah. and they do some really cool stuff with it. They do, and th there's a, a lot of uh, detraction. You know, we, we're going to have to talk about that, of course. Yeah, let's talk about this, because this is, this first initial arc, I mean, we'll see what the future looks like, because it could go either way based on, like, the last two minutes, but uh, this is much more Tila's journey than He-Man's. It is, and I, it's depressing how, uh, how predictable the backlash was for yes. this. Yeah, like, yeah. Oh my god, I don't want to watch a show about a woman. I don't want to oh. watch the making He Man woke. Yeah. Honestly, like, whenever you, if you hear somebody using the terms woke or SJW unironically, they're probably not the kind of, kind of people you want to be listening to. It's, it's like, I. It's not woke to have a female lead character. No, you know? it's, it's pretty normal. It's li literally the reason that they're complaining is because she's had a haircut. It's quite a butch-looking haircut. They automatically assume she's a lesbian, and that's why they think it's woke. <laughs> I wondered now, about that at one point with how much she likes uh, Andra, but they don't. Hey, there's not a confirmation. Thing. If they turn out to be an item, great. Yeah, it's but fine. you know what I really love about this show? It's the fact that they didn't feel like they had to bang you over the head with the fact that they're either an item or not. Like at the end of the day, that's their business. If they end up get, like showing us in the second half of the season that they are an item, brilliant. Yeah. But I don't 
in, it doesn't matter to me no, it and doesn't. it doesn't matter to this show and the fact what does it matter at the end of the day the entire concept of the show like the show is called revelation like it's based around the big revelation that Teela finally discovers prince adam's secret because right. everybody else around her the conflict that comes from the fact that she was like the only main character who they didn't want to tell and she was a silly girl like that's li- from that yeah that's literally it's a course correction that should have happened a long time ago and she reacts as you would expect her to react and she leaves she leaves but here's the thing okay they kill off he-man in the first episode and skeletor fine and skeletor but he it, it's the ultimate sacrifice it's the ultimate act of hero, heroism oh yeah he does this contain the power knowing it's going to kill him yeah like why why is that a bad thing I, I get it. People were like, oh, great, a new series of Masters of the Universe. I get to see He-Man kicking the crap out of the minions of uh, of Snake Mountain uh, for, for 10 episodes or whatever. And you kind of get gypped out of that. That being said, there's plenty of flashbacks during these five episodes where you see He-Man in action. Yeah, it's not like yeah. he's not in this show at all. Um, otherwise, Chris Wood would have been very an- annoyed and upset. And, that and did you in- see... Uh, Kevin Smith's re- responses to the backlash? I did. And um, he, he, one of the things he said was, do you really think Mar- Mattel hired me to make a He-Man show where we permanently get rid of He-Man, like where he's just gone? I'm like, so just hold your horses, people. Cause- exactly. exactly. Um, look, I, 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 I don't want to tar everybody with the same brush. but I, I, It's possible to have complaints about it and not be a douchebag. Of course it is. Of course it is. But what I will say is that if your main complaint about this show is that they're focusing on someone other than He-Man, it's called Masters of the Universe. It's not called He-Man and the Masters of the Universe. Yeah, that was. I think that was a very intentional title move they did. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, this, would this, you, this show is, uh, is much more of an ensemble than previous He- He-Man. It, or it is, it is. And, and it should be, because... You know, if you look at other animation in recent years, it's become very clear that the really good ones are the ones that develop all of the characters and not just the main one. Um, yeah, yeah. So great example of that. It's Avatar The Last Airbender. It's not the Aang show. It's, right. even though he is the title character, it's about more than just him. It's about the, the brother and the sister and everyone else. You know, you know, Steven Universe isn't just about Steven. It's about all of the other uh, yeah. gems, you know? E- even Demon Slayer. It's, you know, it's not just about, you know, having just talked about that. It- it's about more than the main character. There- there's an entire plethora of characters that are introduced as the show goes on, and they get a lot of love. You can't get away with making shows anymore where you have a hero character who solves everything with power, and everyone else is just stood back in awe of him, you know? Like, yeah, I love good, good writing gives everybody their, their fair shake. It does. And I love the fact that this show gives Duncan Man at Arms more to do. I love the fact that oh, Cringer... Awesome in this. Yeah, he is. He's really good. Liam Cunningham is a great actor, but he really gets his teeth into this one. Um, you know, Skeletor isn't there for very long. He-Man's not there for very long. But that means suddenly that Evil Lynn is able... Oh, my God. To- suddenly be an actual character rather than just an accessory yeah and, and lena Le- hetty is i think maybe my favorite casting for this show like she's oh. she fits so well the moment i heard her voice the first time i didn't know she'd been cast in this show but as soon as i heard that voice i was like fuck yes <laughs> get in there i you know i love the fact that everybody is given the opportunity to be more than they could otherwise be um orco oh my god yes oh my god i nobody would have prepared me for the fact that in the year 2021 i would give a shit about orco and this show made you give a shit about orco more than a shit it may it made me fucking tear up yeah uh, and, and i saw it coming and i was like don't do this you bastards don't do this not when he's um, finally got found confidence and and expressed him opened himself up and oh 
And it, like, yeah, yeah, because like, he, it, I saw people about he starts very stereotypical orcos making a mess. I'm gonna put him in a bubble, and then when you see how hard he's been hit by the loss of magic, and like him, I got sad when he starts. He tries to remember Adam and breaks down crying. He's talking about how like remembering him isn't getting easier and that sort of stuff. Like dealing with very real loss and grieving. Yeah, yeah, and, and he has a wonderful moment as well when he's talking to. Um, I, I, Andrew, um, Andrew, yes, on the, on the boat, and he, he says, "Look, if you want to live the life of an adventurer, that's great, but just realize, you know, get yourself a journal, write this stuff down, because the the more of this kind of life that you lead, the less you're going to remember." Yeah, he talks about how it all blends together, and he has trouble remembering yeah. it. And it's just like that's just a sad moment for a character, but also like it kind of shows the the toll that being a, a hero takes um, on you. I, I love the fact that Cringer has a moment where he's not just a cowardly lion or a cowardly tiger yeah. anymore. Like, he actually says something, and, and it becomes obvious that he's not this two-dimensional character anymore that's just there to be scared. Like, he's he's actually... He, he's got he consoles Tila when yeah. she initially, you know, rejects the hero's journey, and he he kind of gives her a gentle reality check it's it's yeah and it doesn't feel like i like character for him either um and it's, and when i realized it was steven root i couldn't help but imagine him talking about staplers and burning down the castle and stuff like that yeah i'm gonna yeah. break down human I'm, I'm, I'm gonna do it i'm gonna do it did you see the um accompaniment show that they put out uh where they um they no. basically Okay, so on Netflix at the moment, they've got a, um, a kind of a post-show thing. Uh, this has become very popular at the moment. And it's Kevin Smith, uh, Tiffany Smith, who is the voice actress for Andra, and right. um, the head of like Mattel TV or something. And they're basically just kind of like talking to the cast and crew about the show and about them being cast in it and what they found interesting about the project and all that kind of stuff. Um, it's a really, really worthwhile watch, actually. Like, very, very cool seeing everybody talking about the project. And um, interesting, and f I didn't for a second think that they would do it twice. Uh, and I, I think we're... I, I don't want to spoil it for anyone, really. No, you dude, shouldn't... We're, we're spoiling stuff for this show, so so go for it. Go and watch it, if you haven't already. Yeah, Pause we're, we're going to bring up some spoilers. So, the fact they kill off He Man twice. Yes, um, I I wonder if he's. I don't know think he's a fully dead yet, but I feel like when the second half starts, because Tila's like applying pressure to the wound stuff like that, and he's not. Yeah. You don't get a shot of him like fading, but I think he's no. going to be out of commission again for a couple more episodes. Yeah, that's exactly it. I think he's out of commission, but looking at the uh, place where he was stabbed, like it's almost like he's stabbed in his side more than than through any vital organs. You right, know, that's like, why I think he's going to live. I'm, with that plus Eternian uh, biology is probably different to our own anyway uh, but still I, they actually say in the show like uh, Kevin Smith starts off by saying so you weren't expecting me to kill him off twice um, <laughs> and then later on he says seemingly twice which is very important yeah, that he yeah. There. so I, I do think although I, I didn't uh, for a minute think that he was dead the second time because again the stab wound was in a place that you it's could it's still probably such play. a good shock where he's in the middle he's literally finishing the sentence and then Skeletor just because he's well, again, also been gone it's because, so good because this is like this series trod the line of the old series in that yeah there was action that people were getting kind of shot by laser beams and stuff but people weren't dying necessarily i mean yeah then, then moss man tries to face the altar and gets brutally burned to ash and passes he on does. you know that's true he does but uh, like i he's he's a plant you know you can get away with that shit okay he's a plant. then he man and scale tour get basically disintegrated you get disintegrated but it's kind of off camera so again we get I away i actually with thought that they had they weren't dead and they'd gotten uh teleported somewhere because there were no bones or ashes or anything that's what I wondered. In a sense, they were teleported somewhere. It's just it happened yes. to be. It's, it's a, I think it's a really cool bit of world building where Mossman could seem to make it say, like, there's no afterlife for the common folk, but for the champions who have proved their worth, there's this paradise where they can all hang out together. And you get to see the the namesake of Grayskull. Yeah, which uh, they, they expand on the mythos here as well, which is really cool. Yeah. Uh, 
and they acknowledge the the past as well. There there are instances uh, during the show where they'll make reference to something, and it'll just be like, "Oh yeah, well we don't have to go into that because you know people who know the show already know this." But you know that there there are references to to certain episodes of the old show, such as when Cringer has that heart to heart with Teela, he says, "You were the one that called me Cringer." And there is an episode of the original series, I can tell you this for certain, because I watched it a few weeks ago, um, where you get the, uh, the the origin of Cringer, and it's actually that Adam was out hunting one day, and there was a, uh, a noise that sounded like crying, so like an animal crying in pain. So he goes to find out what the, the deal is, and there was a, a bunch of kind of like, not dogs, but like wolves or something like that. They were Key all nice. surrounded on kind a of quivering plant. And uh, funnily enough, uh, Man at Arms had given Adam a, a whistle, which he could use for these very animals. Um, it immediate. would basically sound like a, uh, a griffin, which is the natural predator of these particular animals. So he blows his little whistle and uh, they run away. And um, he finds Cringer, who is a little kitten at this point. Right. Shivering like a leaf. And so he takes him back to the castle and Cringer grows up. But there is a moment where he doesn't have a name still and he gets scared by something. And all of the kids are saying, he's a Cringer, he's a Cringer, because, you know, that's an insult which is completely natural. And um, Teela, who is much younger at that point, just says, uh, you know, he, he does strike me as a bit of a Cringer. And that's basically where the name comes from, where it's stuck. Oh, so, so it's a proper callback. It's a proper callback to the original series. And that show, that episode, is actually on YouTube on the official Mattel Masters of the Universe channel. Hmm. So you can go and watch it right now. Listen to us first and then go and watch it afterwards. <laughs> um, but yeah, like there are little callbacks to it. So that just shows that they've paid attention. What I'm really interested to find out, and this would be an extra crease, which I don't think has ever been talked about in the original Masters of the Universe... And this comes as a kind of a two-part thing. The first part is a question because obviously, like, John, you, you've uh, not really got any history with the original series, so you no. wouldn't necessarily know if this was right or not. I don't remember anybody ever saying that Teela was not actually Duncan's daughter in oh. the original. Oh, oh, I, I, you know what? I can sort of sideways say I kind of know about this because they touched on it in the uh, 2000s version as well. Oh, okay. So I think in that, maybe some other versions, she doesn't know who her real parents were, and she was adopted as an orphan by him. But uh, uh, they established, not to her, but that the sorceress tended to a wounded soldier once, and they fell in love and fathered father a child, but she had to give her up because of her duties and stuff. And yeah. it's hinted that Duncan was actually the biological father as well, but it's, it's I don't know about that. Um, yeah. And I'm just gonna I'm gonna say so, I'm gonna just say something silly while I'm on that is that one of my memories of and this is just showing my age at the time one of my memories of 2002 was was that I had a big crush on Tila's design, <laughs> um, and it is fun to see it is fun to see because it's kind of like all these inverses because in that she's very slender and almost moves like a gymnast like a lot of flips and stuff like that she got this long crazy ponytail and obviously we've talked on how this one this one's a lot more real realistic i'd say because it's it's yeah. def muscle definition her hair's not getting in the way uh she's got more of like, an armor like thing and then the original was kind of i'd say in between like proportionally but the outfit's pretty similar so it's so what were you saying about like they they i think they're teasing that uh well, they're they definitely setting up that she has some sort of special heritage to her because her, that turns out to be her fear that she can kind of sort of sense something is not normal about her nature, but she doesn't understand it and that scares her. Yeah. And I'm and there's also the fact that like before Duncan departs, he's like, "There's some, one more thing I want to tell you," and Evelyn's like, "We were in a yeah. hurry." So mm -hmm. I I think I, even whether or not he's he's her biological father or not, it's I mean ultimately. He's her dad, whether or not they're related. Uh, oh, well, but I but uh, I think they're trying to get at alt eventually that uh, that she is the daughter of the sorceress. So that was my assumption because there's another episode which is funnily enough, it was all about origins with me. Um, another episode of the original series, the origin of the sorceress, 
And uh, it talks about her history, how she became the sorceress. Basically, she inherited the title from another sorceress who gave the power over to her. But before she was the sorceress, she was just a regular uh, Eternian uh, peasant girl who happened to have red hair and looked an awful lot like Tila. Well, um, there you go. Now, I, I'm putting two and two together and making 87 here. But I, I I was on the similar track to you with this. I I think that Duncan, if Duncan isn't her biological father, then certainly he took her on as his ward at the behest of the sorceress. Right. I think that Teela is almost certainly the uh, daughter of the sorceress. And potentially the father could be one of the previous champions because Prince Adam didn't become He-Man until he and Teela were both like teenagers, early right. 20s anyway. So I, I think that it's a safe assumption that if there was a champion before then, that uh, potentially he could be the uh, the father. Now that leads to an interesting question and this will really rustle uh, some people's jimmies. So let's hear it. So I think that this show is leading to a final shot where Prince Adam might not be He-Man anymore and uh, Teela might be the new champion. Oh, because yeah. Because they showed us that there have been female champions before during the scenes in Heaven with the woman yeah. that and was really weird. Actually, maybe you can feel something for me. Did you ever watch the, uh, the She-Ra reboot at all? Yeah, I love that show. I still need to watch it. I know... It's different in companies for one because it's DreamWorks who did that. So I'm sure yeah. I know the, they are. It's not connected to this in any way. Uh, but I wonder if there will be any influence in that, or based if you're talking characters or events. And I wonder. I wonder if like instead of, well, actually no. If the, if this is a, if this continuing the original, then Shira still exists somewhere there. They're just not touching on her. I'm guessing. So um, Shira canonically is um, He Man's sister. Yeah, yeah, uh, no, so, and and I know they they would do some crossovers. They had that infamous Christmas special and stuff like that. Like they 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 coexist in the original. So I'm wondering. Um, I was about to say maybe they could reimagine she he Tila as Shira, but now I'm thinking like she should probably be be her own thing. Like if yeah, if, they're, if they give her power. I, I think it would make more sense for her to either be the new champion or maybe take over as the new sorceress. I don't know. Either it's, of those. Yeah, either of those I could see. The thing is, I, I think I prefer the idea of a new champion just because I know how many people it will piss off. <laughs> yeah, I not I, want to piss people off, but if it's the right people, I will absolutely be in favor of pissing them off. Yeah, especially if it's if they pull it off well, they, I'm sure they can make that. This show has some very like epic moments. Like the, I think the big sacrifice moments, both He Man's and uh, uh, Orcos, are like really epic, tense and intense and emotional moments. And yeah, you can do, and you can also do that with uh, they also do it with triumphs. Like I love the montage when uh, Tila faces her fear at the same time you see her allies uh, getting out of their illusions and overcoming stuff like that. Like there's some really good triumphant moments. So you know like eventually like you know we're gonna get a really good comeuppance for skeletor yeah i i knew that skeletor was gonna come back somehow because you don't get rid of mark hamill yes that yes that's like i i'm not as familiar with uh he-man's actor who brought up i think it's chris wood um chris wood, yeah. yeah but mark hamill is one of my voice acting uh idols and yeah mm. you don't and what probably one of the bigger names attached to the cast and you don't you you it would not make much sense to get him for one episode and one flashback. And there's also, I, I do like that. There's still some little touches of humor with him because like, uh, I remember like when they had, they, they have in a flashback, they have Merman take He-Man and Teal off the ship and try and drown them. And before they come up, it cuts to him saying to Evil Lynn, like, would you like to get like maybe a, a granite finish for this bout? And it's just, just <laughs> little, little touches like that. So it's like, we, we, we're not going full grim dark. So, Oh, there is definitely humour within this show. Um, what I really like, going back to um, the the self sacrifice of uh, Orko and He Man, I and love Roboto. the fact, and and Roboto, they all know it's coming. Like they all know without a doubt that if they do this, they're probably not surviving it. Yeah, and yeah. Do it anyway, and I think that there is just such a a really heroic uh, through line with, with all of those. By the way, I should mention. 
Justin Long uh, as Roboto, and uh, Justin Long, of course, like th- this. This show, obviously, because Kevin Smith is involved. Yeah, I was going to say some of the casting is I feel feels very inspired by, you know, he's worked yeah. with Justin Long. Uh, what, what, uh, Harley Quinn Smith has a small role. Um, I've, he yeah. worked with Mark Hamill and Jason Bob Strike Back. Uh, there's probably some other th- Jason Stinkor. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I, I was going to bring that up for a very small role, but like get you know his right hand man to do a little role there that might, that's a funny idea um oh, and there's also a lot of regular voice actors like i think one very interesting casting choice but it also makes sense kevin conroy as merman oh yes which he it's very cool to hear him do a different voice than batman um but it also makes sense because i i believe he was in yoga hosers or one of his recent movies like they they're friends in real life it, yeah it doesn't surprise me because uh, kevin smith being such a massive batman fan um, yeah, I know he he knows. Um, I think I told you on Jan Ann once that because you still haven't seen the clerk, you still haven't seen the clerks cartoon, have you? No, no, I've still got to see that. Uh, Paul Dini cameos as George Lucas in one episode. Oh, nice! And, and I know a big Dini fan of um, D- Dini and, and Smith definitely had a, a relationship, um, especially I, I with the, uh, Smith becoming a comic writer. Yeah. Oh, do you know what? Of course they know each other. Yeah, Kevin Conroy came on um, Fat Man on Batman back when it was an interview series. Well, there you go. Um, when Kevin Smith was interviewing everyone to do with Batman. So Deanie was on there, Conroy was on there. He had the granddaughter of uh, of um, Finger. Oh, the, uh, Bill Finger? Bob Finger, Bill, yeah. Bob Kane's the other guy, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, because they were talking about how Bill Finger had pretty much have been screwed out yeah of he any... got screwed over and discredited for a yeah. long time and and now it's finally been put right i think he, he got credit on um on batman versus superman as a uh, co-creator of batman and they're, yeah, they're probably, finally all right yeah, yeah yeah i i gotta say my um my main clip that i've seen of uh conroy i've seen two things and they both have to do with my favorite batman movie where people one was a con uh, at a con an interview panel where people asked him what he thought about christian bale and he mm. just said in his Batman voice, I'm not wearing hockey pads. And I know that's your go-to ba- uh, Christian Bale impression quote. It is. It is. Because it it's is just a, so memorable. <laughs> yes, it's, a very, it's one of his more over-the-top deliveries. And, but the other one I, I saw, he was on Rob Paulson's podcast where he interviews other voice actors. And they, did, they acted out the end scene between, from Dark Knight between Batman and Gordon. You know, like – they must never know and that sort of stuff and that was just so fascinating to hear in his voice yeah i mean he's he's so recognizable when he's doing that voice i mean even when he talks normally you can hear it in there um yeah he's he's that's when i read stuff that people are saying oh batman's saying this i'm like i hear it in his voice that's that's like that's my bad batman and though i will say if they ever have to pick someone if he dies or retires uh from what i've seen troy baker nails it Troy Baker does a very good job. Um, I'm trying to remember the name of the guy that did the Brave and the Bold. Oh, uh, hang on, I'll look it up. Because uh, he's excellent. Uh, I need to watch Brave and the Bold. I was, I oh, Diedrich Bader, who Diedrich actually Bader. plays so the king in this. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Wait, no, wait. Um, Dennis Haysbert plays. Uh, no, no, no. Adam's father went oh, oh, exiles yeah. Duncan and stuff like that. Yeah, he here gets really he is. emotional. Yeah, of course he does. It's just a who's who of Batman, basically. Alicia Silverstone's in there as well. Oh, and she oh. plays Queen Marlena. Yeah, <laughs> he's, yeah. He's, he's got Batman for a father and Batwoman for a mother. Oh my god, I didn't put that together. You're right. Um, <laughs> also, oh, I will say, uh, I believe it was the Sorceress. Let me pull up. Do you know who Susan Eisenberg is? Mm, I, do you know what? I I don't recognize the name. Okay, so she's she's a voice actress. She played. I'm gonna make sure that I have the right character right. Yeah, she's the sorceress in this. She's best known for being Wonder Woman in the uh, Justice League cartoon. Oh, okay. Uh, she's done yeah. a couple other games of cartoon. She's come back as Wonder Woman for a couple things. Uh, I actually I actually met her at a convention, and it sounds like she compared to other voice actors, she does a lot more commercial and promo work, which is why her filmography isn't as huge. But she's she's good at what she does. She's a good Wonder Woman and a good sorceress. Yeah, very good sorceress. Um, Kevin Michael Richardson's in this again. Oh, as when Beastman started talking, I was like, "Up oh, there he is." He he put on more rasp, but like Kevin Michael Richardson, if you're familiar with him, he has a very recognizable voice. 
Yeah, and then, um, as I already mentioned, Dennis Haysbert, who most people will remember from 24 as uh, President David Palmer. Yep, I also know him as the Allstate guy, but I don't think they have those ads in the UK. Yeah, that's not something that we have, unfortunately. Allstate's an uh, auto insurance company or some form of insurance company, and he's been their spokesman for ages. I see. Okay. I mean, he's a, he's a very good guy to have as a spokesman for your company because I trust him, you know. But yeah. he plays King of so that's, that's pretty cool. Yeah, the OG uh, uh, hero. The OG hero, and um, they it's a little bit on the nose, but they have a uh, a, a, a guy called Hero. Uh, oh, I missed that. In this show, yeah, one of the uh, the other champions in heaven, the one whose castle they turn into a forge. Um, he's That's called funny. Hero. That's and funny. I'm um, sure, looking at all of those champions' costumes, talking about callbacks to original material. Oh yeah. I think all of their outfits, the male characters anyway, I think they're all variants that you could buy of He-Man. Oh, that would make sense, actually. That would be another another little Easter egg. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I've seen that black outfit, certainly. Um, I, I don't know my He-Man variants, but yellow I, I can one, totally buy it. The the yellow-looking one, it looks very much like a original Eternian take on his armor from the new adventures of He-Man. <laughs> Wow. Which it would not surprise me if they referenced that, even though it's a steaming pile of crap. Um, hey, it probably it, has its fans. There's, oh no, of course it does, because everything has its fans for I, some. Str- I think reason. I said this when we did uh, episodes, an episode we talked about every like Sonic cartoon, and there were ones we really disliked. But I'm like, Sonic is such a massive fan base, you know that the, every incarnation has its diehards. <laughs> and God bless them, because yeah. some of those are really hard to stand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you you've talked a bunch of them. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm, to be, I'm, I'm a Sonic OVA stan, so I get it. Yeah, well, I mean, Batman versus Superman, still a good film. Uh, it's okay. So there you go, it's there's okay. my cut, nailed to the mast. Uh, but yeah, this voice cast is ridiculous. Um, it's very impressive, both from the regular voice actor side and the Hollywood side. Yeah. And oh, actually, Henry- I got to mention a big the, the you know the lead, uh, Sarah Michelle Gellar as Tila. And I find that so funny because you guys on Gen N just did TMNT a few weeks ago. We're, we're going like, oh, whatever happened to her? And here she is. Here she is. Yeah, this came out of nowhere for me. Um, I, I didn't even recognize her voice when I was listening to her. This isn't like a Lena Headey moment where I was just like, oh, I know that voice because I'm in love with her. Um, <laughs> I was a big Buffy fan back in the day. And we all know what Sarah Michelle Gellar sounds like. But this... It, when you know it's her, you can hear it. Yeah. But not knowing it was her when I went into it, I was like, good voice actress, never heard of her before. It's just it's just so strange how that works with some voice actors or actors in general. Some some of them, and you'll remember this from, from Jan Ann, some of them sound the same in every single role they do. Yes, you got the Patrick Warburtons and the Christian Shawls. Yeah, the Kirsten Shaw I'm especially thinking of. I love her, but... It would be nice if she could try another voice at some point. Um, that being said, you cast her for a reason, and that is her voice. Others, they are chameleons. You will never be able to tell who they are unless you know it's them ahead it's, of time. It's funny because I some, somewhat consider Mark Hamill to be capable of that. I will say in this, he sounds very Joker. It's maybe a little raspier than average Joker at this point, but it's it's very similar mannerisms. Uh but then I've seen him in stuff like regular show where I'm like, I would never have been able to guess who that was if I didn't look it up. Yeah, I, I think that when he tries to do Maniacal, it will always sound like Joker because it can be difficult to break out of that particular I, I think case. it's not just that. It wouldn't surprise me if that's what some people want. I actually, I got a little story about other voice actors. Do, uh, do you know who Greg Griffin or Greg Delisle is? I, I'm afraid to say I don't know. Uh, she's in a lot of voices, like Vicky and Fairly Odd Parents, and Mandy and uh, Billy and Mandy. Uh, but my favorite one is that she's Azula in Avatar. Uh, she, did oh, a, okay. she did a fantastic job with that. And when I went to see her at a con panel, and I got a chance to ask a question, my roommate at the time was a big Blizzard fan. Uh, you know, notwithstanding the the recent news about them, but it, uh, he played yep. Heroes of the Storm, and there there was a Diablo character she played, and the design and voice were very similar to Azula. So he had me ask if that was a coincidence or if that's what they had in mind. And she was like right away, oh yeah, the directors were definitely asking me to uh, channel Azula for that. They were big fans. 
<laughs> Fair enough. So sometimes I, I'm, I'm sure they're very aware of that. That's even what they're going for. And to be fair, I can see some parallels with, with Skeletor and Joker because they're both a mixture of, of kind of funny and over the top and dangerous. Yeah, yeah. Um, and we, with Kevin Smith being on board, I, I imagine that there probably was a bit where he was just like, do Joker, do Joker, do Joker. Yeah, uh, I don't know if he was there for the, re- if he oversaw the recording, but I could definitely see him asking that at some point. Them, he was, although I think it might have been table reads more than recordings that he was at, because Stephen Root, in that little uh, post-show uh, thing that I was talking about earlier, mm-hmm. um, he actually um, said uh, during the um, during the table read, he was going to do the traditional cringer voice, where he's very kind of like, oh my god! Oh, over the top. Uh, yeah, and Kevin Smith said specifically, no, I want something a little bit different from, from you. I, I want more of you and less kind of cringer. And so interesting. essentially how Stephen Root ended up on the character that he he ended up with was uh, it was just a little suggestion from Smith and, and that's where he, he went with it. I, I think I'm remembering that correctly. I could be I'll, wrong. I'll have to watch this after show now that I've finished this run. Um and I will say uh, something that I can't relate to comparing this Cringer to the original, not just because I've never seen the original. A big change they made for the 2000 version was that Cringer didn't talk. Yeah, yeah. Um, th- there were some changes they made with that show that I was just like, oh, why did you have to do that? Um, and, and that was kind of one of them because Cringer was always a, a really fun uh, character in the original one. Although now I'm thinking about it. Yeah, Cringer did talk in the original yes, one, I'm sure. I, I, I've never seen the original, but I know people complained or, like, noted yeah. it. I mean, I, I don't know. Maybe it could be Mandela Effect and he never talked, but I'm pretty sure he did in the original one. Um, I, I'm just glad that we got Orko because there are... <laughs> I'm, I'm always concerned whenever a new version of He-Man is in the offing that they definitely bring all of the main characters back. because Jesus, Orko. Yeah, like, for, despite my love of the movie... Like the one thing that I wish they had done was bring Orko in. Oh, instead um, of Gwildor. I I could have had both. Honestly, I wouldn't have minded both. Um, but I think they said that they want the problem was they wanted. I guess they wanted to make it that he so that he would still float like he usually does, and that was it would just take too much effects, too much money. That's true. Yeah, uh, uh, thinking about it, I, I think that probably would have been prohibitive for them. Unfortunately, I, man, I, I would have settled. I would I would have settled for an Orko that walks around because that's better than no Orko. Yeah, I would have got serious Final Fantasy IX vibes from that though. Yeah, because uh, VV and the Black Mage looks looks like yeah. Orko that 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 had oh. that invisible face. Yeah, like Black Black Mages and Orcos are basically the same thing. <laughs> it's just Orko's, one float. Orko's technically more of a blue mage. That's very true. Yeah, yeah. If, if you're gonna hands be- are an indication. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but, and, you know, I I think we're uh, we're kind of winding things down but one other thing I want to bring up that we see really briefly how badass is Skeletor's redesign when he gets the power at the end you know what I oh you don't I, like it I I, I was uh, call, call me call me a, a silly old bastard but if there was one thing to take from the movie it would be that over the top ridiculous golden Skeletor design oh the golden multi pronged yeah. one he gets okay like, or maybe some touches from it I'm not sure about the floating head, um, like but I, I've only seen one shot of it. I think in motion, it will more than likely be more effective. Uh, again, movie uh, reference, the moment where he becomes, maybe, maybe I'm misremembering this because I watched this like a week ago now, when he finally gets the power... Uh, <laughs> I love the fact that Skeletor finally gets to say I have the power. Yes. Is it? Am I misremembering this, or is there almost like a projection of him over Castle Grayskull? Yeah, that's the final shot. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So in the movie, there is a moment where they've captured He Man, and Skeletor is broadcasting to all yes. of it. Yeah, he does like a hologram. He's a giant hologram over Castle Grayskull, along with everywhere oh. else. Nice little callback. I it don't know. It might also be, I think, I have seen the classic theme song. I think they do like a transparent projection of his head laughing over Castle Grayskull. So it could be a nod to either of those. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah, it's all interlinked. Yeah. yeah. Um, one before we do wrap up, I did want to mention Powerhouse Animation Studios. Oh my, they are awesome, aren't they? They they are just in their wheelhouse at the moment. They've done so much good work over the last few especially uh, for years. Netflix. Yeah, I, especially for Netflix. I mean, Blood of Zeus, which is it doesn't get anywhere near enough love. I need to watch it. It's a great show. It very much fits into that swords and sandals Greek mythology style of storytelling, but it has a very Castlevania style feel to it. And and of course Castlevania, which just wrapped up. Uh very I'm only halfway through it, but I would say if the second season is an indication, I'm little I think this is literally the best video game adaptation I've ever seen. Second season is a marked improvement over the first for me. Yes, and the first was good and the second blew my mind. Yeah, the, the reason the first one doesn't hit quite as well is because it was originally meant to be a feature-length movie, and then they cut it down into episodes, and that's why it, the pacing feels a little bit strange on that first season. Right. Uh, second season, absolutely superb, and from there on out, they basically just they hit their stride and they just keep going. Yeah, I've heard people were really happy with the finale. Excellent finale. I won't say anything about it. Yeah, but I, I'm gonna I'm gonna watch that at some point. I, I, I was very, very happy with, uh, with with where it ended up. Um, Seis Manos is excellent. That's the other the, one I've seen. I need to finish it, but it's it's really good. Very, very good. I, I love the kind of 1970s kung fu feeling of it. Yeah. Uh, in fact, it's transplanted to Mexico. Um, it's very cool. I like that a lot. And um, then there's a... Um, there's another show on here which is uh, fairly close to the hearts of those of us at Generation Animation for reasons of uh, previous guests, which is Epithet Erased. Yeah, which I, I actually just found out that they, when I was going through, their, I thought that was a fully indie production, so really cool. Uh, I still need to watch that one, actually. But I will say, uh, uh, Brendan, Jello, Jello uh, I found out recently, because I... I Man, this is going back to what I said in our in the first part. Uh, I do a, an out of context Bobo Bo account on Twitter. That's mm. just clips and fan work. Uh, he followed it recently and suggested some clips to post. Oh, nice! I'm gonna have to give that a look because I'm dimly aware of uh, Bobo Bo. I, uh, as much as I love it, it's a very acquired taste. You have to be prepared for total madness. <laughs> I'm fine with total madness. Okay, then yes, do give it a watch. Unfortunately, it's not streaming legally anywhere, so you have to do some digging or splurge on a blu-ray set but uh or, or check out the twitter account and see if the clips are strike your fancy will do absolutely will do but yeah i i think that powerhouse have been absolutely pulling it out of the, they've been pulling up trees in the last few years and, and to think that they haven't been doing tv that long they they started off in 2013 yeah with um, it's a small world and uh they, since then, they've really kind of like found their stride. They've done very well. They've they've done a lot of commercial work. They've done some video game work as well. But um, their TV stuff is superb, and I'm very much looking forward to their Skull Island animated series. Oh, are they doing that? Yeah, that feels like a good fit for them. If if the Skull Island movie is any indication, like because they're so good at action and and set pieces and like and they've grittier... kind of set going on as well if it's set in the same kind of era so yeah i'm uh i'm interested to see what they do with that they, they it hasn't been announced when it's coming out yet but it is in their upcoming slate so yeah and i'm interested to see what they do with the rest of this especially if 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 they get more seasons which i think they could because critical reception has been good and i'm sure like despite fans being divided it allowed them are tuning in out of curiosity mm. So yeah, the I we've we've kind of jumped ar around a lot with this. Like even though I I often try and go like chronologically, but that's okay because I think we've definitely made it clear like that the show is is really good and why we feel that way. Absolutely, like the the, the plot itself is, is pretty straightforward. Yeah, uh, but I don't think that's a that that's a bad thing in this instance. Like I love it's the fact it's got a lot of good character moments along the way and action set pieces it's got very much both it's sides focused. it's character focused with with a, a an action skew but I, I just there's something about the idea of um like when evil lynn turns up as an old woman you know it's evil lynn immediately i figured yeah but the, i love the twist that she was working with the sorceress from the very beginning and the fact that they are all teaming up uh for the greater oh, good and it's a it, gut punch when she 
goes back to Skeletor at the end. You could tell that she thinks about it, and she even says, I was really starting to like you kids. You know the reason why, though, that it, 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 it's so effective is because, like I said at the very beginning, like in the original series, she's literally just an accessory, you know? And I'm not talking about accessory to murder. I'm talking about literally an accessory, like a spangly bag. Like, Skeletor just keeps her around. Yeah, she's it, just sidekick material. She's a sidekick, total sidekick. And this show actually gives her the opportunity to spread her wings a little bit and show that she's not all bad. Like, the moment that they um, that, that they put together a grave for Orko and she puts her helmet down next yeah. to him. Like, that entire section was just, just heart-rending. Um, and if it wasn't for Skeletor coming back, I can completely see her just dropping the evil part of her name. And Yeah, this is, this is good, Lynn. Part. Yeah, I love that joke. Were you, were you born evil, Lynn? Or did you add it to your name later? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But yeah, we. this is, for all the rather pointless controversy online, uh, oh. look, look, if you're, if you're, if the problem is, is less uh, women in my He-Man show and more that you just wish you still got more of, of Adam and Skeletor, that's fair. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. judging by where we leave, we end this arc. I think you're going to be seeing a lot more of them. Uh, yeah, and if you and also the show is bookended with a full episode of Adam and in, in first and last. So, and, and he, he's around. He's a presence. Absolutely, and the thing is as well, like wishing for this show to fail is not going to get you more He Man. It's going to get nope. you less, right? So, if this show gets a season two. I don't expect it to just become the Teela show. I, I would expect it to be if He-Man is still a, an entity by the end of it. And again, what Kevin Smith has said, they didn't bring me on board to kill off their cash cow. Right. Uh, He-Man is still going to be an entity. I think it might be a case of them splitting duties on it. And maybe, because we've already seen the sword split into two pieces before. Oh, split it back and give one to him and one to Teela. Maybe, yeah. Or cool. we forge those so that you have two slightly smaller ones or, or more modern looking swords because the design of the power sword is very dated and, and could very do with an option. So that's definitely an option for them and I would be interested to see if that might be the case that they'll split duties and, and there will be a he-man and a he-woman or she-woman or whatever the fuck Teela wants to call herself. Um, yeah, she just don't do she that's taken. Yeah, she was taken. So may maybe, um, or maybe she'll just call herself Teela because at this point, why not? She just add a dash between syllables for for punctuation's hey. sake. Teela, Teela, <laughs> and the masters. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so uh, I want to thank you again for coming on. We've had a great conversation today. Uh, you've definitely convinced me to check out some more of this anime you've talked about, uh, including Demon, giving Demon Slayer a second shot because I want to get into the meat of it and see what I think then. Uh, okay. and, me on and uh, I'm, I'm happy that i was able to uh, throw some uh, uh, anime in your di general direction that you could consider the demon slayer i i do think that it's one of those shows that it does need more than a couple of episodes to really get a feeling for the whole thing and i can understand you know i i've long said on generation animation like give it a couple of episodes if you don't like it you don't like it there are some shows where you do need to kind of stick with it to get the full benefit and uh, steven universe is a big example of that that first season's rough yeah yeah and and you know shows sometimes take a little while to find their feet but demon slayer definitely like by the time he's passed his test um and he goes off to become a full-fledged demon hunter like very yeah. good show. i think very for me i want to see what it's like when the rest of the main cast shows up because i know it's not just him and nezuko on their own no, I think the the end title screen tells you pretty much exactly who to expect. Right. Um, so it's a it's a very good show, but I'm I'm just happy that uh, I was able to um, talk about some stuff that potentially uh, you'd be interested in seeing. And uh, again, I, I want to thank you for having me on because uh, it, it's been a lovely old time talking about uh, He Man and um, people being upset about and being so woke. Yes, and also <laughs> anime and Ace Attorney. Ace Attorney, indeed. I'm definitely going to look into the Switch version because it might actually give me reason to pick that up again. Yeah, and it's cheap. Um, so where can people, again, where can people find you on social media and what are some of your projects you'd like to uh, tout? 
Uh, right, well, I'm uh, I'm on Twitter at Real Dave Roberts, and uh, actually I've got a pinned tweet on there, which pretty much has all of the links that you'll need for all of my projects and side projects. But quick rundown: um, you can find the podcasts at uh, fanoffmedia.com. That's uh, Generation Animation and Erie International. And uh, the BS Cast is at bscast.com. You can search for all of those podcasts on Google Podcasts or um, Apple Podcasts, and you'll find them there as well. And uh, the YouTube channel, again, the link is uh, is on my uh, Twitter. But uh, if you search for, I think it's youtube.com forward slash Dave Plays Gaming is the short URL for it. Uh, but you'll know you found my channel because it's got Dave plays in PlayStation Two text. Nice, that's nice. That's, that's one of my favorite systems ever. It's a great little system and very easy to animate an opening title, which is why I picked it. Well, there you go. <laughs> um, myself, you can find me on Twitter, Tumblr, and Instagram at Behanart. B e h o n a r t. Uh, in terms of projects, you can follow uh, on Twitter, Wario Reanimated, for the WarioWare Gold Reanimated collab, currently in its second phase of production. Uh, you can follow uh, this show on Sketch Watch Play on Twitter and Facebook. You can follow uh, with the aforementioned Bobobo Out of Context. Uh, I believe that is Bobobo OOC. And you can look forward to some other stuff coming soon. I'm really trying to get underway with uh, Spacious, which is kind of my big passion project in terms of original series and that'll definitely get its own twitter uh where you can just keep get tabs on that uh but yeah again big thanks to dave for coming on uh and for inspire inspiring suggesting a really cool topic to talk about and for educating me on some anime and it was fun for me to educate him on ace attorney as well we don't have our next guest or topic set in stone just yet so i can't announce anything but definitely stay tuned to the uh to the twitter and facebook that's where i announce stuff that i don't announce on the show uh, and so uh, I am John Flurry. I'm Dave Roberts. And for an eternity, we don't say goodbye. We say good journey. That's not good. a nod in. I don't think they do a nod to that in the show, but that is a quote that I remember from the movie. That's a good quote. It is. It is. That movie has its merits. <laughs> <laughs>